on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Welcome to Corner of the Galaxy on cornerofthegalaxy.com. I'm Josh Gessman along with Wendy Thomas. And on today's show, we're going to go, be going over all the latest LA Galaxy news as the offseason looks like it's getting ready to really heat up. We'll talk about Landon Donovan's decision and whether or not we think AJ De La Garza, Alan Gordon, Mike McGee, or even Dan Kennedy will be back with the LA Galaxy in 2017. We'll also get you ready for the expansion draft that's coming up in just a matter of days, and we'll go over the hiring of Pete Vianis to the general manager position, as well as talk about the LA Galaxy's head coaching search. There's a bunch to get to, so don't go anywhere. Corner of the Galaxy on cornerofthegalaxy.com starts right now. Listening to Corner of the Galaxy on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Now here are your hosts, Josh Gessman and Wendy Tom. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Corner of the Galaxy on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Josh Gessman, Miss Wendy Thomas, back with you in the off season. We are on an MLS Cup week. That's right, the LA Galaxy not playing, but two other teams are. One of them actually matters. We'll talk about that, I'm sure, in very, very brief detail. But the LA Galaxy have a lot of news breaking and a lot of stuff that people are talking about, things that you probably knew, things maybe you didn't know. And we want to get to all of that, but before we do, welcome to the show, Miss Wendy Thomas. Wendy, how are, are, you, are you handling the off season okay? Not bad? Uh, oh, I'm so deprived, Josh. Yeah. I'm so soccer deprived. I've resorted to watching the Champions League. I'm so desperate. I mean, God. So, you, I know, you poor I know. Thing. So, I mean, I, I have, I actually have enjoyed um, the MLS playoffs a bit. I thought that the Toronto-Montreal game was awesome. Yep. And I am looking forward to MLS Cup. I think it could be a really good game. I'm rooting for Toronto to win it. But, you know, yeah, I'm so accustomed to the Galaxy being going deep into playoffs that ending the season in October just seems weird. It, it was November, but just barely. <laughs> just barely Just November. barely November. I, look, I had to go back and look at it because I was of the same belief. But, yeah, it was November. I think November 6th was the, was the last like game. It was ago when it, we last played soccer. It was, and, and quite honestly, I mean, uh, listen, you can't always get to a championship, but you'd expect the Galaxy, especially if you look at how it all went down and, and, and who ended up prevailing. I have to think that the Galaxy in maybe a little healthier times could have done better, but quite honestly, they underperformed the entire year. Um, you, you get what you deserve overall. I mean, it wasn't yeah. it wasn't one of these where, quite honestly, Seattle um, totally tanked the first half of the season and the second half of the season comes on strong, um, you know, makes MLS Cup. And the Galaxy have done that, too. It's never unearned, but at the same time, it's always nice when the best team, you know, goes to MLS Cup and, you know, has a chance to do it. FC Dallas was probably that team. Uh, injuries probably knocked them out. But uh, for the Galaxy, they just... They weren't good enough in 2016. They weren't good enough in 2015. Um, you know, and now we have to look ahead to 2017, Wendy, and whether or not we think they're going to be good enough in 2017. So there's a, a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, some MLS news coming out as well and guard it regarding some uh, targeted allocation money. And so lots of things to talk about. But I think where we'll start, we're, we don't want to bury the lead, but we want to provide a lot of room to talk about uh, general manager position being filled by Pete Vianis. Uh, everybody heard the audio from the from the conference call that was held by the LA Galaxy, LA Galaxy President Chris Klein uh, was on there answering questions from reporters, and uh, I had the full audio from that call. So if you want to, go to our page, cornerofthegalaxy.com, and of course you can listen to the entire complete, 100% complete audio just edited down to uh, so that way you don't get all the pauses in between. Um, so it, it's interesting because I think Chris says a ton of things that if you're not paying attention or if you're just look at listening to the general manager announcement, um, you're you're not getting the full story of, of what was said. So, uh, Wendy, let's start. Targeted allocation money. 
Uh, MLS looks like, and Grant Wall's reporting, uh, Kevin Baxter actually just came out before we gone on and is reporting that uh, MLS is going to announce an increase in targeted allocation money in 2017 as well. And we went from basically $800,000. It looks like they're going to get an increase of $400,000 to about $1.1, $1.2 million. I think there's some, some rounding errors or some round off money in there, Wendy. But uh, bottom line is that Major League Soccer is infusing cash into the teams, um, an additional 400000 or roughly $400,000 per team. And it's something that I think everybody was expecting. And it looks like even Bruce Arena before he left was expecting this as well. Yeah. And I think that it reflects that the uh, league believes that the implementation of TAM was successful because it achieved the goal of bringing in those mid-level players who, you know, would fall above the threshold of $468,000, whatever it is, uh, and the kind of DP money that you want. That's what they wanted is those to bring in some of those mid-level players in the context of the LA Galaxy. We brought in Yell Van Dam and it proved to be a really great success. He was wonderful for us. And I would not be surprised if the LA Galaxy used a little bit of that extra TAM money to sign Yel Van Dam to a multi-year extension, spread that through his contract to sweeten the deal for him. Yeah, it makes the most sense that that seems like that's already, I don't know, it's, it's a foregone conclusion. Uh, that would be the most likely outcome is that Yellow Van Dam gets a raise. I think you might see some other guys get some raise, but it's interesting that I think one of the weakest parts of Major League Soccer is the depth. And it's not so much, you know, the designated players. I, I think they've done okay bringing in some big names. Um, there are some flops out there. Absolutely, definitely. Steven Gerrard um, and, and a bunch of other ones. Juan Pablo and Hell with the LA Galaxy was a pretty big flop as well, if you mm -hmm. want to go back to that as well. Um, but when the you look at... legacy of international flops. Yeah, I mean, it's... It, and it happens across... Listen, it's not an oh, MLS oh, no, thing, right? Everywhere. Yeah, this this New York Red Bulls. Look at their history. I mean, my goodness. I mean, I mean, you can go all the way across every league. There are going to be big players who are brought in who just don't do anything. And uh, with Major League Soccer, the problem is that you're relying so heavily on those players that when they don't do anything they can have they can severely limit not only the spending money that the the team has um but also just the overall play on the field and if you look at how expensive and it used to be a while back that as you got designated players that you would have to pay like three hundred and fifty thousand dollars towards the cap on one player um and if you got the next designated player then it was like two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars so it was diminishing as you went and then you had to buy a third designated player spot for like hundred and fifty thousand dollars like you kept going into these things um that would be diminishing returns well major league soccer has decided that your first two designated players now um are the max budget salary player which is that 453 or 473 i can never remember what right. that exact it number changes is every, they change it every year they do it and it does change but that's the budget that is getting hit with your designated players now so you're spending you know if you have three designated players you could you could basically be spending a third of your uh, entire salary cap just on having three designated players so yeah. it feels like with this tam and this is just me sort of looking at it they're saying you know, if you wanted to get away from the designated players a little bit, we're going to give you some more cash to put that middle of the road, the good right. players, not great players, the good players, the solid backbones of the team, we're going to give you more money to spend in the middle of that roster or the upper, maybe the upper middle class of that roster, not the, not the upper class. So I, I think that's an interesting sort of turn because as you've seen, Wendy, the teams that have had a lot of success haven't been going older, they've been going younger and I think uh -huh. you can get some of these younger players, younger DP rules in effect as well. All these, they're, they're sort of trying to skew this, this TAM and everything. It feels like they're going younger. Just in my yeah, mind, I feel absolutely. philosophy. A Atlanta signed a young Paraguayan international to a young DP deal earlier this week. And I think that the teams that are finding success are skewing younger, at least under the age of 30. Right. And I mean, I would, I would argue that, you know, with respect to the TAM that we used, that you know, Yel Van Dam was more productive than any of our DPs. So, yes. I mean, it could be that the the LA Galaxy is an example of how the league is changing and that it's acknowledging that you can't really be successful with mid-30s players. You, you do have to skew younger, and we also need to add depth in order to improve the overall quality of play in order to make it a more marketable product. Yeah, I mean, it's more exciting, definitely, and I think that soccer fans, and I will be, I am not this person who thinks that every soccer fan in the United States is some genius about soccer. Um, I certainly wasn't whenever I started, uh, and I've learned a, a ton since then, you know, just growing up in this, but um, quite honestly, I think the soccer fans are getting smarter in the United States, which is a good thing. That's what you want to have happen. Good. 
right? Yeah, you want you want us to have a thriving soccer culture. That's right, and I think you're getting there. Um, and I don't want to say that I'm putting down fans that weren't smart before because that's what always happens. I'll say something like that, and somebody will be like, "Are you saying we were stupid before?" I'm like, "Yeah, some of you were stupid before. That's you're just gonna have to deal with that a little <laughs> bit. Some of you, some of you have gotten smarter. Although on Twitter, I think some of you have gotten uh, less smart. Let's put it that way, um, as well. But the LA Twitter Gal- dumbs us all down. They, I feel I feel stupid just going on Twitter every day. <laughs> Um, and, and quite honestly, talking to myself on a podcast on a regular basis, I don't think that makes me any smarter either. But uh, the LA Galaxy... You're talking to me on a podcast. Clearly, I have to get my thesaurus out whenever you start. <laughs> I have no idea half the words you say. That's okay. It's my Arizona State education and you're lawyer- lawyering, so... Oh, come on. Yeah, that's right. how it was. Anyway, so so we go into TAM. So this TAM is huge news. I mean, it, it really is. It, you wanted an increase in the salary cap. That's what I really wanted. The players, the last CBA thought getting free agency in was better, and I've talked to Todd Donovan on the show about that, is they said they wanted free agency, kind of almost at all costs to get that, mm-hmm. because once you get your foot in with free agency... Right, then you can just lower the age, the new requirements, go. every single CBA. And they did get an increase in the salary cap. They, I just think that the players were... Essentially, you know, deciding that pulling the trigger on free agency and getting it into incorporating it into the deal was more important than getting a huge increase in the salary cap. So, yeah, no, no, and it is. But if you look at this, Tam, what they've effectively done is raise the salary cap. Yeah, I, mean, I know. I mean, well, the thing is that a lot of the ownership groups during the last CBA negotiation, as Jeff Carlisle was, you know, reporting on, was that there's a lot of ownership groups that really wanted to increase right. the, the salary cap, right? There's these high spending teams that are like, listen, let's spread a little money around. Come on, let's increase the quality of play. Let's be more ambitious. And then there's other teams that are like, no, nah, let's be conservative. You know, that's the, the rate of growth amongst the, the league ownership. It, it's not like they all concur with respect to how they want to grow, the rate at which they want to grow. And so, you know, a little bit of dissent there. Hey, Bruce Arena has, has questioned the ownership group many times, calling them boys when men were needed i'm gonna miss bruce i'm gonna miss bruce and his little jabs at people we can look forward to more fights between bruce arena and don garber in the future don't worry i think i think it's gonna be a lot of fun and remember bruce arena is just across the hall in at stubhub center he literally moved his uh boxes from his (laughs) office down maybe like i don't know 20 feet maybe maybe that far so anyway bruce arena is still around stubhub center i imagine that you will still see him around on occasion for la galaxy training not that he'll be there in a coaching role but he'll be around to say hi and see how people are and do the whole thing and you can count your lucky you, you can count on it that Bruce Arena will be at Major League Soccer games actually scouting Major League Soccer players so uh, with all that stuff said it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see how the LA Galaxy move on from Bruce Arena and you know we sort of get into if you look at the people who the LA Galaxy have lost starting in let's even say 2012 right you look at David Beckham leaving you can't replace David Beckham there's there's no way to do that right and not even just from a player stance just from a a draw, a personality, all of those things, you can't replace David Beckham. That's impossible. You can't replace guys like Landon Donovan. Whenever Landon Donovan left, you're not going to find another Landon Donovan. You're not going to find another Robbie Keane, Wendy. These are all guys who you cannot replace. You can, mm-hmm. you can try to find other players. They can possibly do some of the stuff that they do. It's almost like Moneyball where, like, you know, the, the, when Brad Pitt, that's how I remember We're going to recreate them in the aggregate. Yeah, he, exactly. We're going to recreate them in the aggregate. Let's see. I need, uh, I need seven goals. Uh, you know, Landon Donovan scored 15 goals, so I need seven goals from this guy and eight goals from this guy. So we need two players who can score us each seven goals, you know, that type of thing. So um, it, it makes some sense, but you're not going to replace these guys. And the, the, the talent suck that has sort of drained away from the LA Galaxy just in recent years is is staggering whenever you look at just sort of the players that aren't going to be on the field anymore if you take them as a whole. Yes, um, but LA Galaxy fans will respond to winning games. I mean, the lack of enthusiasm has in part been attributable to the dis- departures of players like Landon Donovan, but it's also been due to the fact that we were a much less impressive team on the field in 2015 and 2016. You know, we we lost a lot of games. I think that when the Galaxy win games, people show up because they think, hey, I'm going to have a fun time. I'm going to watch the team win. And I think that, yes, it's true, the personality and appeal of Landon Donovan and David Beckham and Robbie Keane, very difficult to replace. But you can bring in new players to excite, you know, the fans. If Giovanni Dos Santos scores goals left and right, I promise you people will show up to watch him play. Yeah, okay. But so if Giovanni Dos Santos doesn't score goals, but the LA Galaxy are well, still that's winning. That's the problem. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, it, that's where I get. The, the whole thing is the LA Galaxy finished third in the Western Conference. Um, they Yes, they tied a ton of games. There's 16 draws. I keep looking at that number thinking that, like, I got it wrong somehow. No, like the, it was- the, 
It was 16. 16 times they went on the field and they drew a game. That's a lot of draws. That hurts. That hurts a lot. At 12 wins, you know, they still finished third in the Western Conference. 2016 wasn't a total loss. In terms of LA Galaxy, yes, it was. You didn't win anything. You won nothing. You got locked out of Champions League. You got knocked out of the U.S. Open Cup when you should have won. You got knocked out of the MLS Cup playoffs, quite honestly, against a team that I was not impressed with in the Colorado Rapids. I know they did a lot this year, um, but the, to me, they just weren't a scary team. And, uh, you know, you see that Seattle was able to just run right over them. I mean, quite honestly, yes. any talented team should have been able to run over Colorado, and the LA Galaxy just didn't have it, and that's that's too bad. All right, so we go on. We talk about some of the players. Now, listen, I have been on the A.J. De La Garza isn't coming back train for a really long time. Oh, I hate that train. I know, and it's and I've been driving that train through the mountains, um, you know, <laughs> over the plains. I've it's Christmas, so there's lots of train talk around Josh's house. Um, so all those things, I've been I've been on the AJ De La Garza train is leaving. I'd I'd like to walk it back. I'd like to walk it back. Oh, I feel I feel rather Look, confident. He's not so sure of his prediction. It's 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 I predict things. Listen, if I change my mind on things, Wendy. It's uh-huh. because my mind was probably changed by something. You know what I mean? I know, I know. Yes, you're you're the real LA Galaxy insider, I think, Josh. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't, Adam Serrano I, made me call himself the LA Galaxy insider. Pasha, my, you are the real LA Galaxy insider. Well, well, I thank you for that. I think Adam uh, having the full-time job and getting to cover the team at, at all costs wins that award. But I thank you for the <laughs> kind compliment regardless. Um, but I think that AJ De La Garza is probably going to be back. In fact, I think there's going to be a lot of players who are back. If you're worried worried about the LA Galaxy Wendy uh, as in listen they lost they lost their head coach and general manager uh the likelihood of them losing almost their entire coaching staff is probably a reality that's been hinted at many many times um so the entire coaching staff is gone you have to have a new general manager a new head coach uh Landon Donovan isn't coming back you lost Robbie Keane you lost Steven Gerrard you lost all these things and it seems like everybody's leaving and everything's going away I'm here to tell you that that's not the case, that the majority of the team will be back in 2017. That's what I'm feeling. Or at least that's what I'm hearing. That's what I'm that's what I want to tell you to, to just calm down. Yes, Landon Donovan is retiring again. Uh, Wendy, that was probably almost 100% due to the fact that Bruce Arena is no longer I know. with the Galaxy. I knew, a sa- I knew the second that Bruce announced that he was going, I was like, yeah, that's, that means Landon's not coming back. Because Bruce is the reason that Landon came back. He's the only coach I think Landon would want to play for. So, yeah, I knew I knew when Bruce was hired. I was like, dang, that's yeah, well, it. That and the LA Galaxy weren't going to offer Landon Donovan a designated player contract. And anybody who suggests such a thing needs to stop suggesting such things. You're the same people who are like, give Robbie Keane another designated player contract. No, no, no. Let these guys go. It's time. I love Landon Donovan. If he wants to come back and we could throw him some TAM, great. No problems. Let the LA Galaxy do that. But he does not need to be on a designated player contract. That, that ship has sailed, unfortunately, and I love Landon. I'd love to see Landon on this team, but that's not going to happen. He's he's done. Um, Like I said, I think AJ De La Garza is going to be back. I think Alan Gordon and Mike McGee, guys who I thought for sure would be done at the end of the year, I think that they could be some of those filler guys. You yeah, know, like the- Bench. I would, I would, I'd like to bring Mike McGee back as a filler if the salary, but if the cap allows it, because actually – he was decently productive. Like if you look at his stats, he was he was like he scored some goals and got some assists. And and these guys are like, you know, for lack of a better term, they're LA Galaxy family. It's AJ De La Garza the same way too. They're LA Galaxy family. You want to try to keep these guys as much as you can because they're just sort of good for the rest of the guys around to be like, hey, this club takes care of people. Now I don't want to gift people contracts they don't deserve. I don't I, no. I like to get away from that as much as possible. But um Alan Gordon, Mike McGee, they could make it back on the team if there's salary cap room at the end, and if they're willing to play for, hey, Mike, Alan, I got X number of dollars left over. Here's what I got. You can come play with us. I mean, we'd love to have you back. If not, I, you know, I feel bad. I'd love to have you, but we can't. We can't afford it. It's one of those. You fill in all the other spots and that type of thing. I'll tell you another guy who's probably going to be back, and and this is going to make you sad. Well, first of all, I expect Leonardo to be back. You can you can all just you uh, know, come on cry and what whine. Is this yeah. Gonna- and why? <laughs> Leonardo will have to like what? retire. I don't know. What's going on? We'll, we'll see. I, listen. He, he, he saw Chris Klein like, you know, hatchet someone to death. And does he know like where the body is buried for every member of the LA Galaxy coaching staff? 
What is it? Why? How does he manage to stay on the LA Galaxy roster? Now, I didn't say he would be protected in the expansion draft, but I mean, realistically, who's going to take? I'm going to take Leonardo. Come on, I might take him. I mean, if I'm starting a new club, maybe Minnesota United. No, who I expect? No, you would not. No, I wouldn't. No, it wouldn't happen. But I, I, I think that that's still going to happen. So you can look at Leonardo. I'll tell you another guy who's going to come back, and because I was looking over contracts and sort of seeing mm-hmm. who has a contract still and who's going to be back. Um, expect Dan Kennedy to be back in 2017. Oh, no, come on. Well, listen. I mean, there used to be this sort of unwritten rule in Major League Soccer that you were on a two-year contract and it was a club auction on the second year. I don't know that that's the rule anymore. It seems like that these guys are under contract and they're going to play, which means Dan Kennedy will make two hundred and something thousand dollars oh, or whatever it was. For the love of Mike, please, can we not bring back Dan Kennedy? There, you know, the other thing is, lots of people have been asking me if Brian Rowe is going to be the starter next year. Like, if there's any question, I would say yes, a hundred percent as long as the LA Galaxy don't make a move for anybody else. And I don't think that they will, but it's just, it's one of those things that sort of seems to be, I don't know, floating out there, at least discussed among reporters, is that, you know, Zach McMath might be looking for a team, that type of thing. So, you know, would you bring in, Wendy, this is a great question, would you bring in Zach McMath uh, for Brian Rowe? Would that be something you would think about? I would get rid of Dan Kennedy. No, I would get rid of Dan Kennedy. Why are we talking about this? Brian Rowe is the starter. Right. Diop is the backup. Right. And Dan Kennedy should not be on the roster. Well, it could be. You remember Dan Gargan was being paid by Major League Soccer this year? You know, Did you remember seeing that on the salary yes. things? Yeah, Dan Gargan got a, got a paycheck from Major League Soccer for this rest of the year, even though he didn't play for the LA Galaxy. Um, I don't know if they can do something like that for Dan Kennedy, but I mean, it's a lot more money than what Dan Gargan was on. So it'll be interesting, but yeah, just it's, it's contracts. Hey, I mean, this is the good thing. You as a lawyer should, should be appreciating the fact that it looks like the contracts actually mean something now where when you sign a two year contract, it actually means a two year contract. I think that like, I think that, that in terms of. Uh, professional sports teams that actually abide by their contracts. MLS is light years ahead of, ahead of Europe and South America. I yeah. mean, we have in, in the United States of America, I can inform all the, the listeners, contract law is enforceable. Mm-hmm. It is not something which is, you know, like under in Italy and Spain when it's like, you know, oh no, they like promise to pay you a million dollars. They actually pay you a hundred thousand dollars. Like, no, it's not the way it goes here. Here yeah. you get what you are promised well it, it always seemed that major league soccer had sort of that that option year right and it was always the club option it was never the player option and so i always expected that that would sort of be the way that they let players go and that's how they they did but it seems like that that has maybe as it should it should start to oh. go away but anyway so dan Kennedy, hey you, if you make a bad deal wendy you're stuck with it now remember that i don't think you can find chivas usa to offload dan kennedy like they did juan pablo and hell to bring in robbie keen all right, so uh, so all that stuff is interesting. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think if there's any other. Uh, Ashley Cole, that is the question everybody asks me a lot about, whether or not Ashley Cole is coming back. What, do you, what are your thoughts on whether you'd want to have Ashley Cole back? Uh, well, my understanding is that he was in a one-year deal, and part of that deal was only um, permissible because Roma was paying him so much money that he could afford to come here and only earn $300,000. Um, I don't think that Ashley Cole would uh, be amenable to playing in MLS for $300,000. So I think, and since he's not going to get a DP deal, I just think that it's a sort of a non-starter. I, I don't, I mean, maybe he loves Los Angeles so much that he would just be like, yes, I'll just come and play and money means nothing to me, but you right. know, I doubt it. And so in that likelihood, I just think it's a non-starter. Yeah. I, I, I don't so- think he's going to want to do that. So my understanding is that uh, that he's I, I think that he still could be under contract for this next year. Now whether or not he actually comes back, I don't know that he loved um, L.A. enough to come back, Wendy. I don't I don't know if that was a that was a thing. I think that if he wants to get out, that the L.A. Galaxy will let him out. Um, but otherwise, you know, they're very well could could see him back in with the LA Galaxy. I don't think that matters that much, to be honest with you. Um, you want to skew younger for this team. You did that by getting rid of of Robbie Keane and Steven Gerrard. You did that by, quite honestly, seeing Landon Donovan retire again. Um, you could do that by seeing Mike McGee and Alan Gordon off. I mean, you're talking about those are the upper echelon age guys that are sort of dragging that average uh, up towards the 30s and the 32s and the 33s. Um, now you're seeing a guy like Ashley Cole, who I think is going to be 36 or 37 um, mm-hmm. in next year. It just doesn't make any sense to me that you would spend. Not By the way, $300,000 is a ton of money in Major League Soccer for a defender. 
All right. So it is. yeah, it is. So you can get you guess what? You have a guy named Robbie Rogers who who granted I don't think had a very good year. Um and anybody who says otherwise did not watch the games. Um yeah. so so I, I that's my first thing. But you have a guy who Robbie Rogers who plays his natural position is as as a, as a left back. Uh, you could put him there, and guess what? You have a guy named AJ De La Garza who can play at right back. <laughs> I mean, this, and then you have Yella, De- Yella Van Dam and Daniel Stairs who could play in the center. And Daniel Stairs is a guy you want to continue to develop, Wendy, because good lord, he's young and he's cheap. Let- he's cheap. That's primarily he's he's twenty six, which is not like it, that's, I mean, for, in I, terms I know. of center yes. backs, it's fine. It's he's he's young, but um, he's cheap, super he's cheap. cheap. He's so cheap. that's why he's really keep good. him, keep him. That's what you know. One of the ways the LA Galaxy had so much success uh, starting in around 2009 was the fact that they had AJ De La Garza and Omar Gonzalez who were brand new to the league um, on, you know, really cheap contracts coming in and playing and starting. Um, the more starters you can get on cheap contracts, you know, for the LA yeah, Galaxy, the better. The better. That, yeah. yeah, absolutely. It gives you more money to spend other places. And that's sort of the whole idea. And obviously that's not a foreign, you know, concept for people to understand. Uh, the expansion draft is coming up on December 13th at 11 a.m. Pacific time. That's just three days after MLS Cup, so it's going to happen. You know, what is that, Tuesday? December 13th? Mm-hmm. Tuesday? Yeah, so two. Oh, my God. It's on, It's right around the corner, Wendy. Oh, boy. And the LA Galaxy don't have a head coach. Or do I they? I know. Or but but I'm sure that there's a list. I'm sure they've compiled. I'm sure before he left, he compiled the list of who he would protect and who he would not protect. I'm not. I'm not you know, I you know, and the only people who I'm really concerned about getting taken, I'm sure will be protected. So, and and quite not and quite honestly, you don't have a bunch of designated players you need to protect it either. You get to protect- yeah, I know. It's like we're not protecting Robbie Keane, Steven Gerrard. We have we we don't have. We're missing two out of our three DPS, which opens up two spots that a lot of other teams will will have to use. Um, I so I think it's. We shouldn't be too freaked out by our. I mean, maybe we'll lose one. Maybe one, we'll lose maybe. one player. I I don't think so. Maybe that I is. I would be more, most concerned about losing someone like Ariel Lasseter, but yeah. I bubble think bubble that, player. I think that probably won't happen. Yeah. So the whole deal is, uh, ten total players will be selected. Um, that's down from twenty the last time there was an expansion draft. So only ten. That means half the teams in Major League Soccer won't have a guy selected, which is great because you can only have one guy taken from your team. Once one guy is taken from your team, you're out. You're done. That's it. No mas. Uh, obviously, we've talked about it, the generation Adidas players or the homegrown players that are on a club supplemental roster are excluded. And the reason that I make that a point is that means Giassi's artist, who is a homegrown player, but is on a senior roster, will need to be protected. So whenever you're doing your mock protected drafts, make sure you protect Giassi's artist on there because he does not get an exemption. Uh, the other thing I need to tell you about is, of course, the foreign players. Um, you have to protect a certain amount of foreign players. Uh, I think for the LA Galaxy, they're going to end up having to protect two two or three. Uh, I need to get a list of foreign players one more time so that way I can go over them again. Well, but, Giovanni Dos Santos. Uh, Giovanni Dos Santos is one. It's actually, there's some there's some guys who you wouldn't expect to be... Uh, well, Ariel Lester, isn't he technically listed as being Costa Rican? Yeah, I think he was. I think he was born in Costa Rica. Um, let's see here. Actually, if you talk for a second about some maybe some of the guys you think that, that might be, I can actually, I think I can find well, it. Well, no, I think we'll protect, I think we'll protect Giovanni Dos Santos, who is Mexican. I think you could protect Emmanuel Boateng, who's listed as being Ghanaian, even though he spent tons of times, you know, he was on that program where they come from Africa. So, I mean, he's Ghanaian. Uh, Gilles Van Damme is Belgian. That's three right there. I mean, then, you know, you could potentially maybe protect someone like, uh, I don't know, uh, Baggio Husinic, who's listed as being from Bosnia, AJ de la Garza, who's listed as being from Guam. I mean, obviously these guys are all like American, <laughs> like, right. like AJ de la Garza is totally American, but he plays for the Guam national team. So maybe you could protect him. I don't know. Yeah. So, um, let's see the guys. Okay. Uh, Emmanuel Boateng, Ashley Cole would be an international player that if he was coming back, you'd need to protect. Giovanni Dos Santos, Steven Gerrard is gone. Uh, Raul Mendiola, Yella Van Dam, and uh, Diop will need to be on there. It, and you have to protect a certain number of them. But if it's like three or five, I mean, okay, Giovanni Dos Santos, Yell Van Dam, Emmanuel Boateng, that's three. Yeah, I, I think you Well, See, here's the thing. You have to protect a certain a minimum number. Right, because the, what basically what MLS is saying is we don't want you to flood the market with international players when there are only X number of international spots. So you can't like that would that would mean that like picking them wouldn't be that fair. So you, I think the LA Galaxy are going to end up predict, pre, uh, protecting three. They have That's to a protect much three. Bigger problem for other teams than it is for us because the LA Galaxy on average is 
has many more American players than other teams. If you look at like the, the rosters of places like Orlando City and Vancouver and Dallas, they're very international. We actually tend to skew very American. Yeah, and and that's uh, that. Like you said, that is a good thing. So anyway, the expansion draft coming up. Um, everybody's been freaking out about this. I've seen it on Twitter. I've seen you, I've seen y'all freaking out. You need you need y'all need to chill. All right, it's the off season. So first of all, you should be chilling. And secondly, y'all need to chill because the worst the LA Galaxy can lose is one player. And quite honestly, I think that they'll you know guys who will be left unprotected be guys like Dan Kennedy. I mean, for the most part, the Jeff core <laughs> the core of the LA Galaxy will will more than likely be protected. I don't think you're gonna have any problems with that. And even if they do, the, if the LA Galaxy leaves somebody exposed, right? This is one of those you're gonna be keyed off. If they leave somebody exposed that you consider a good player, there's a reason for that. They probably you want to get rid of them. All right. And whether it's contract and whether it's money or anything else, there's going to be some question marks. If they leave a big name exposed, then you will know why. And then that well, the will. Reason, I'll give you an example. The last time there was an expansion draft, Bruce Arena did not protect Alan Gordon. But the reason why is because Alan Gordon was on a contract where he was earning over $200,000 a year. And he figured that the likelihood of a new team wanting to spend $200,000 on a 34 year old man was very low. And it turns out that that was correct because he was not selected. Yeah. And if you even look at how uh, Sean Franklin left the team, it wasn't an expansion draft, but it was in one of the, what, re entry drafts or things that have sort of happened. It was the fact that Sean Franklin was making two hundred and twenty seven thousand dollars as a defender and Bruce was like listen I can't keep spending all this money on the back line something's got to give and you saw that it's constant turnover in Major League Soccer because the salary cap doesn't allow you to give guys raises on a continual basis which is what they're going to expect if they're playing well by the way the starters they all expect more money and more money and more money as it keeps going salaries keep rising it's one of the things that you should worry about for guys like AJ De La Garza who have been with the team so long that you sit there and go listen you, you know realistically the Galaxy can't continue to keep raising AJ's rate even though you love AJ and it's because eventually that's going to be outside of the budget that they're that they have set with the salary cap and they're going to have to let them go to somebody else who can afford that so that's that's where the turnover happens that's why people don't get brought back a lot so that's the stuff that you need to sort of keep an eye on as you go through. All right, already already a half an hour through the show. That's not so bad, Wendy. We've been uh, we've been cruising so oh, far. Oh, you and I can talk forever, Josh. Come yeah, on. yeah. Realistically, it's me telling us that we can't talk over an hour that gets us to stop. <laughs> if you wanted twenty four seven like broadcast, uh, I would accommodate. Yeah. I would be able to do it. Yeah, no problems. Just I just need some soda, maybe some tea in the morning, and we'll be good to go. We can talk about the LA Galaxy forever. Um, all right, we're gonna get into now the LA Galaxy and they're hiring a Pete Vianis. Uh, it, it's interesting that they picked him, but it's also not surprising. And I'll be honest that my knowledge on general managers throughout the league, besides maybe like one or two guys, is probably pretty limited. Um, so I, I can't even tell you whether or not I think this is a great hire or it's a horrible hire. I think it's a safe hire. Um, I think that breaking it into even into two roles. Remember, Bruce Arena was general manager and head coach. There's very yeah. few guys who sort of have very, that. That's a really peculiar situation. Yeah, so for, for a guy to be head coach and technical manager, most teams have the two roles separated. They do, at least in the United States, they do. Now, I, I think a lot of times over in Europe, uh, at least that's what I've been told. I, I again, um, that in Europe, it, it's maybe a little more commonplace to have your manager also be the guy who's you know the general manager and, and bringing guys in with the help of other people. You know how it always goes. But Pete Vianis was the helper basically to Bruce Arena last year. So Pete Vianis was doing all the GM stuff, or so I understand it was doing all the GM stuff that Bruce didn't have time for because he was also the head coach. So you have a guy who got a little bit of uh, on the job experience, plus he's been around the organization. Um, basically forever um, drafted in the uh, in the 2000 MLS Cup Super Draft by the LA Galaxy spent nine years with the team won a US Open Cup 2001 and 2005 uh, MLS Cup in 2002 2005 and he captained that 2005 team to the double so this is a guy who who bleeds the uh, the white blue and gold so to speak um, it's a consistency play if you want to make an argument for that Pete Vianis coming in that was the consistency play. He was he was he's a Bruce Arena disciple. Um, in terms of he's learned from him, uh, he knows he sort of understood what the job entails just by looking at um, all the stuff that Bruce was doing over the last you know probably a couple of years. Um, Pete has sort of been involved with this organization. It's it's very interesting to see that they hired him and that you know it seems like he's already hit the ground running. This was this was something that once Bruce announced he was leaving, guaranteed they they immediately went over and said, okay, Pete Vianis is our guy. We're gonna go just roll with that right now. Yeah, that is probably exactly what happened. Yeah, and I think, 
And people are going to say they didn't take a hard enough look at other people. But I also think that a plan for Bruce Arena's exit has been put in place before Bruce Arena decided to leave. Because I don't know if they thought Bruce was going to come back for another two years. Now, ultimately, he ended up signing a two-year contract extension with the LA Galaxy before U.S. Soccer came to him and asked him if he wanted to coach the, the U.S. men's national team again. Um, so it seems like perhaps they had sort of this, this plan, and I think Bruce was even involved in the plan of succession in case Bruce left. Well, Bruce is very much a loyalty guy. He has always put guys to work for him who he has known for many years. You know, Kurt Anolfo is an example of someone who played with him at UVA, someone who played with him at DC United, someone who was assistant when he was the coach of the national team, someone who he hires, hires as the assistant to coach uh, LA Galaxy. He, and I mean, the, the MLS is littered with coaches who previously worked or played for Bruce Arena. And he has always been someone who promotes people he knows and people he likes and who he's friends with. That's just, that's what he does. So it's no surprise that, you know, the LA Galaxy currently is staffed with largely people who are friends with and worked with and played for Bruce Arena. Yeah. And, and I think that. It's it's interesting now. I mean, even if you look at the role of LA Galaxy president Chris Klein again, who was a guy who was a guy who played for Bruce Arena, uh, who knew Bruce Arena, and then ends up uh, transitioning into the front office. Um, I think that you're seeing the the full weight of the pressure being put on these two guys with Chris Klein and with Pete Vianis. They always had Bruce as sort of that that outlet or or the guy to take the heat off because ultimately, and I will say this with a hundred percent confidence. It was Bruce Arena's decision on anything that really happened with that team. There's, there's Absolutely. Yeah, so there was always the guy who was above you. Even Chris Klein, as the LA Galaxy president, had Bruce Arena telling him what to do, basically. And and I yes. don't want to I don't want to mean like that they weren't working together. I think they were, but it was ultimately Bruce's decision. Bruce would say, Yes, we're we're going this direction. And that and, and that's, that's really the way I mean it's ironic because in a way we have no idea whether Chris Klein, Pete Vanus, these guys whether they know anything, whether they're terrible, whether they're good. Because one thing that I know for sure is that the LA Galaxy, since Bruce Arena has arrived, has been run completely, 100%, through Bruce Arena's decision-making, good and bad. Yeah, it has. They... Just, he, he is the ultimate authority and has been for the past eight years. And so we really are in a bit of an informational disadvantage with respect to these the people currently occupying these roles whether they're going to be productive and positive influ influences because honestly their stamp on the team we probably have not seen it much until now yeah i agree with you 100% i think it's it's like you said informational disadvantage is probably like the understatement of the year um realistically we don't have a great idea and when we do have even an inkling of an idea what happened um it may not entirely reflect what's happening now and not previously so i mean these guys, and, and we're going to start talking now about the LA Galaxy and their head coach, um, and, and realistically what we th what I think is going to happen. And Wendy, you can tell me whether or not you think I'm crazy or not. But mm -hmm. um, ultimately, it looks like in the very near future, especially with the expansion draft coming up, the LA Galaxy will look like they're going to name Kurt Alfo um, the head coach. I mean, that seems to be everything's pointed in that direction. All the arrows are going Kurt Alfo, Kurt Alfo, Kurt Alfo. And Kevin Baxter told you long before Grant Wall ever reported that Kurt Alfo was the front runner. Kevin Baxter came on the show and told you that Curtin Alpha was the front runner. All right. In fact, like a week and a half uh, before that. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's been everything. And, and I can tell you, you know, just sort of talking to people, it just seems that that is already a foregone conclusion. However you feel about that, you better get your feelings ready because I think that it's not going to be very long. It, it makes no sense for the LA galaxy to wait any longer. Um, they probably have talked to everybody that they're going to talk to. In my mind, it was probably a list of three people that they probably talked to that were realistic people that could have taken over for the LA Galaxy. Um, I think Kurt Alfo was one, and Chris Klein publicly said that they talked to him already. Uh, that was on the conference call last week, So, and we already knew that. That was, that was obvious. Um, 
you know, the guy who we all thought, Wendy, you and I even talking before we started, who said, hey, if you wanted to play the continuity move, if you wanted to do everything, then you bring in Dave Sarakin because Dave right. Dave is that guy. He's been the associate head coach. And with he has first, a much better record than Curtin Alfo. He, he has been a, a head coach with Chicago Fire. There's a bunch of other places as well in college. Um, and I know I'm forgetting something. I, I'm going to do my best to get Dave on well, the yeah, show. Well, yeah, but he actually won a trophy with the he Chicago did. Fire, which is, I mean, if you can win with the Chicago Fire, that's astonishing. Well, at the same time, that was a different time in Chicago. Chicago land, but yes, but yes, I mean, yes, there's, yeah, I mean, okay, so there's a few ways you can go when you're looking for a head coach. You can do the continuity move, which, in my opinion, would be Dave Sarachin since he's very experienced, he's been successful, he's won trophies. He obviously, as the current head, you know, assistant coach, you know, he would be uh, the natural continuity move. Or you can say, listen, we're going to go out and try and find someone who is just got an incredible record of wins, has won tons of trophies. We know that he can be successful, in which case you would go for someone like Ziggy Schmidt, who's on the, you know, he's available. You could bring him in and he's, you know, he has coached LA Galaxy before. He's won many, many trophies as a coach in MLS. Right. Possibly you could go for someone like Oscar Pereja, in which right. case, you know, he's probably the, the hot ticket right now in MLS in terms of what he's done with FC Dallas done a really really good job has won a couple of trophies for them just this year um or you could say you know we're gonna go out and find someone new and exciting we're gonna try and you know let's brush up in the international market right and right you try could. and really shake things up you know a la Patrick Vieira you know the way they brought him in they're like he's international but he's gonna learn the system he's got tons of ideas he knows a lot about tactics etc cetera, etc cetera. Cardinalfo is not any of those things. Um, so I don't understand why he's being put in this position other, I mean, at least from an empirical standpoint. I mean, his his record at DC United was very bad. His record at Kansas City was also poor. Mm -hmm. He has never won anything coaching for Los Dos. Uh, he has not developed any players such that they be went from being Los Dos uh, players to being LA Galaxy starters. I know that you could say Daniel Stairs, however. You could say Jack Daniel, McBean as well. I mean, I think that that's going to be... Jack McBean is not a starter for the LA Galaxy. It, he, he did not play for them. Yeah, he, this, he will be. I, I, and I think I think that's the right, only he argument. Will be, but yeah. he didn't. I mean, I, I'm sorry to say, I mean, Daniel Stairs joined Los Dos when he was 24 years yeah, old and, I agree. and spent one year there, and therefore he did not develop him. No, he did no, not yeah. develop any player. So that, I, I fail to see what empirical evidence supports this decision. The other, so I mean, I think that he has been at the LA Galaxy for a few years, and that he knows people who work for the LA Galaxy now. I'm sure he's well liked. He's a really nice guy. I'm sure, like you know, gives high fives to everyone in the hallway. I personally, as an LA Galaxy fan, do not care about that at all. Right. It means absolutely zero to me. And I think that it is natural that your personal feelings for someone and how the fact that you work with them every day infiltrates your decision making such that it's very hard to be um, impartial with respect to whether they are actually the appropriate person for the job. Um, I think that even with respect to talent development, there's other people within the LA Galaxy who are better developers of talent. I mean, Brian Clyburn and what he's done with the youth academy teams is much more impressive, and from my perspective, than what Kurt Analfo did with Los Dos. That being said, this if this is their decision, you know, it's one that, uh, you know, the LA Galaxy fans will either, you know, be enthusiastic about or not. It's sort of, it's a similar situation in some ways to the Red Bulls hiring Jesse Marsh to replace Mike, Mike Petke, although in my experience, my, from my personal perspective, I think Bruce Arena is not really someone that you can replace since he's sort of a singular figure within the, you know, larger uh, U.S. soccer world. He's sort of uh, irreplaceable. Um, but if this is the decision, then I think that all, you know, what I would like to know is how, how long is he going to be given this opportunity? And if it does not succeed, right. then who is responsible for having made this decision? Because if this was like the business world, if this was Wall Street, if this was the corporate world, one way in which you force you know, decision makers to absorb the consequences of their decision is by saying like, listen, you're making a decision which is not supported by the record. This is not supported by empirical evidence. You're basing it on your gut, on instinct, on what you think is the right move. But you're not basing it on 
what the rest of the world can see. So if you're going to make this decision and you know, you like this person, you think they're the right person for the job, then if this fails, you will need to be held responsible for right. this decision. Right. So I, you know, I'm just wondering what kind of timeline do we think that he's going to get? Is, is he going to get a half a season? Is he going to get a season? And if he fails and it turns out to be a terrible decision, you know, whose decision is this? Yeah, yeah, it seems like, and, and listen, I think you're going to look at guys, if it fails, and you, you asked timeline, in my gut feeling is that they're not going to give anybody, regardless of who the coach is, they're not going to give them a very long rope here because, quite honestly, it's way too important of a season um, for the LA Galaxy to, to go do, to, to, to fail um, at something like this, to fail in finding the head coach. I, I get why they're going with Cardinalfo, and we said the continuity play is Dave Sarakin, and I think the LA Galaxy would say that the continuity play for them is Cardinalfo. Um, now, regardless of how you feel, I love Dave Sarakin. I love Cardinalfo as well, and I got to cover him a lot with LA Galaxy 2. Um, I really enjoyed him. You have to remember that the idea behind Los Dos was it isn't to win, and and Honestly, it's not because I've seen them do things that uh, you could question afterwards and you'd ask Kurt, you know, why something would happen. It's like, you know, these guys need to learn this part of the game. So their job was his job was to develop those guys. I mean, even the L.A. Galaxy sending Jack McBean off. You have the USL's leading scorer uh, who gets shipped off in the middle of the campaign while the L.A. Galaxy are first in the Western Conference um, and, and just track it, just just drilling people. I mean, Jack McBean was running over people. They saw that his skill had advanced advanced way past USL and they wanted him to go somewhere else and get, have a challenge do stuff. They shipped him off and LA Galaxy 2 struggled for the rest of the year. Despite that fact, Jack McBean still finished, I think, second or, or third in the USL scoring and only missed it by like a goal or two goals to be the golden boot winner in USL and he didn't play the last eight weeks. So there's a different thing. Don't I, I'm going to say that there's plenty of ways that you can judge Kurt and Alpha, Wendy, because he has a record out there and we can go over it with the Kansas City Wizards, uh, with DC United. So you can use that as, as something, but in terms of LA Galaxy 2 and their record and what they've done, um, for the most part, they they they're there to develop. They're not there to win. And I've seen it happen so many times in those games where they you see a decision that was made, whether it was to bring a player out or put a player in was, you know, to help the senior team or, you know, to get somebody minutes or enable to develop players and not worry about the result is. And even Kurt would tell you that, you know, and granted, that would be a good out for him to be able to tell you, Wendy, that it wasn't about winning uh, at LA Galaxy 2. They almost won. Uh, they almost won one year. Uh, the, see, they've only been in existence since 2014, so it's not even a long record with LA Galaxy 2. But I'll say that I think the LA Galaxy think this is a continuity player, and I think that they think that because they want to skew younger. And granted, there has been no mandate, but everything they're saying is we want younger players. We want those academy guys. We want those guys who have come up through LA Galaxy 2. We want to start putting those guys in more guys like maybe Bradford Jamison the fourth or. Um, I'll say his name just so everybody will stop hounding me. Jose Villarreal, if he could have a bounce back season, you know, is he somebody who can make an impact on the senior team as well and build around those guys? And it's definitely a Jack McBean. I think the LA Galaxy are counting down the days until Jack McBean comes back from Coventry City as well. So all those things with Kurt Anolfo. Now, again, Wendy, you and I were talking before we even started. Uh, Kansas City Wizards, if you want a fair assessment of what Kurt Anolfo can do. Look at his three years with the Kansas City Wizards. He was hired by Peter Vermees whenever Vermees was acting as basically the general manager. All right. And after, by the way, after Kurt left, uh, Peter decided to name himself head coach, which, which is nice as the general manager. You can do that, apparently. I'm sure with everybody else's blessing. But if you look at his time with uh, the Kansas City Wizards at the time, this is 2007 through 2009, his record's 27, 29, and 22. Uh, it's certainly not impressive. His highest finish was in 2008, his second year. That's fourth in the Eastern Conference. Uh, before he got there, sport, uh, Sporting Kansas City, I want to call them that, but back then they were not. Uh, the Kansas City Wizards were not a good team. Fifth in the Eastern Conference, fifth in the Eastern Conference, fifth in the Eastern Conference, fourth uh, under Anolfo in 2008, and then sixth in under Anolfo in 2009 when Vermees took back over, and then Vermees comes in and you know gets them third in the Eastern Conference and first. Now, granted, you get him sort of in the Sporting Kansas City days in 2011, which totally changed the perplexion of that club.
But at the same time, you look at his record in Kansas City, and it was it's it's not a good record. Um, and then you want to go to DC United because everybody's pointing to this as well. Uh, doesn't even get through a whole season. Gets hired basically uh, in uh, hired by DC United on December twenty eighth, two thousand nine. Is fired on August fourth, twenty ten. Is that something, Wendy, that that I think could happen again with with Curtin Alpha? I do. I think the leash is that short that it very well could be a half season, which is unfortunate because as we've seen with Bruce Arena teams. Bruce was always given the uh, the the benefit of the doubt, so to speak, that uh, Bruce Arena's teams didn't exactly come out and fire in the first half. But I do expect that Colonel Nolfo is going to be that guy. I think that everybody in the club already knows that. Um, that's sort of my my feel. I think that if you think the LA Galaxy are going into any of these expansion drafts or any of these drafts that are coming up, Wendy, I don't think that they are unprepared for them at all. I think that with the general oh, manager no. of Pete Bruce Bionis, Arena, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure that he had like a succession. There's a whole succession plan of like when Bruce leaves. The Gal- I mean, there's multiple people. I mean, set, creating the expansion draft thing is, is not a big deal. But my primary objection to this is not necessarily, it's not a personal one, and I have nothing personally against Kurt Adolfo. Right. It is the fact that I perceive this decision to be emblematic of a trend that is uh, within US soccer and MLS, and it's a, a pernicious one where people are not judged in, by their performance, by their track record, because everyone knows one another. Everyone has played with one another, worked with one another. They all came through the development academy together. And so it's like this very incestuous circle of the same dudes who know each other. And it's this boys club of constantly people circulating in and out of jobs and teams and being hired and fired. And when you're fired after doing a terrible job in one team, it has no merit in terms of whether you get hired for another team. So Richie Williams does an awful job with the United States U-17 team uh, at the U-17 World Cup, and he gets fired, and then he just gets hired to be the real Salt Lake assistant coach because right. he knows this guy, and they're all friends with one another. They've known each other for decades, and what I would like to see in MLS and U.S. soccer is people being held accountable for records. And in this instance, since he has a losing record with his former teams, it is disappointing to me that the LA Galaxy would choose to hire him based on this, you know, perception of continuity that he's been around for a few years and we know him and we like him and he's a great guy and he's our friend. It's that just doesn't mean anything to me. And I would I wish in life, in sports, in the world at large, that merit was something that would carry more weight in terms of what you've done, what your record is, you know, how prepared are you for this position? You know, do you have results that demonstrate that you are competent? And it is just frustrating to me when I feel like it is more a system where it rewards who you know and who you're friends with and who, you know, you know, just this constant recirculation of the same people who are all friends with one another. Because I, I, I don't think that MLS is going to improve until it incorporates really talented coaches into its ranks. And at the current time, there's just a lot of coaches who are just not that impressive. Hey, Eric Winald has been saying it for a very long time. And whether or not you're a fan of Eric um, or not, I think that he brings enough ideas to the table that somebody should have taken a chance on him to give him a coaching job by now. Um, and quite honestly, if you look at sort of his career, why would Eric go down and coach like a lower level, lower level club or, or a college club whenever he can make a ton of money doing what he does for Fox? Um, so if he was ever going to leave, it would have to be like a big head coaching job. You know, there's there's guys who are there. I will say that I don't think that this situation of um, I like your u- use of dudes because I knew that um, dudes was you were you were grouping them as a group. Like there here's a bunch of dudes that all know each other. Um, there's a lot of dudes who yeah, know each right? other, right? And, and I, I enjoyed that. Um, I think that's a problem in in every major sport that you ever see. I mean, one guy gets fired from one job, he goes over to another one. Yeah. Now, I'll, yeah. Now, now I'll say this. I'll say this that sometimes that. Going into a different situation, I mean, Curtin Alfo has never been in a situation where he had the means of somebody like the LA Galaxy behind. And if you even look at Kansas City Wizards before really that 2010 turnaround, 
Um, they were, you know, a mid-market, small-market team. They played in a baseball stadium, you know, all this stuff. They're, they're totally different than Sporting Kansas City now and, and what they have done. And even D.C. United, you look at, like, their just slides that they sort of took here starting in 2007 and 2008. I mean, it was not the same D.C. United. So, I mean, you're putting him into, I think, a better situation, but you're also putting him into a situation where this is the fulcrum, this is the balance point of whether or not, realistically, the L.A. Galaxy can survive a Bruce Arena exit. Um, because remember, he had to save them in 2008 and 2009 whenever he came in uh, to replace uh, Rude Gullet. So it, it's you look at what has happened and the history of LA Galaxy coaches, there's been some great ones. Um, there's been some really, really, really poor ones as well. And this is sort of going to decide whether or not that's a good one or a bad one. Yeah, and I wish that the system we had in place was one that seemed to reward really exceptional talent. Like the U16 coach, Brian Clyburn, he... Um, it's very hard to measure performance within academies because it's like not competitive and like it's right. you know it's this strange thing. But like when they do like these tournaments or invitationals and stuff, like so the U16s this year um, made it to the final of the Liga MX mm -hmm. um, international final, and in, during that process they beat the FC Dallas Academy, the Philadelphia Union Academy, San Jose Earthquakes Academy, and they only lost they fell to Club Tijuana, which is a Liga MX team. Right. And when he was coaching the U14s. And they did um, the invitational, um, the, it was like a Cayman Islands invitational. They beat um, a bunch of international teams. And then they won after beating Manchester City's youth team. And so if you're talking about like development and talented coaches, like why don't we, why don't we promote people like that? Why, why do we, you know, promote like we promote people with losing records and overlook people with like amazing records. And I don't know. Right. what kind of system that is it seems upside down to me yeah but i mean the the bottom line is that we were talking about you know designated players or, or players that come in on a bunch of money and flop and that yeah. has happened over We've and over plenty. again and and i keep trying to tell people as well if you even look at like the academy or los dos and homegrown players listen if you sign and i'm just going to throw out a number because i don't know what the actual percentage is but if you sign like 15 homegrown players you're going to get maybe one or two good ones out of that. That means the rest yeah. of them are, you're going to maybe have a couple okay ones, and then the rest of them just aren't going to pan out. So that's yeah. that's youth development, I understand that. But it's the same thing with coaches, and we see it in you know Major League Baseball or even in the NFL. You have a guy who could not win with a team, who like just was the worst, and people are running him out of town on a rail, and then he goes to another team and he wins. And, so it's, it, and you also see the guy who has won everything and done everything, and then he goes to another team and he loses. It's just... It's unpredictable. Now, I'm with you, Wendy, that you would look at the the empirical evidence and say that Curtin Alfo, it's not even, I don't have to stretch this. He's a sub-500 coach. Um, but I think that, you know, he could very well have success with the LA Galaxy where he hasn't had success with sport in Kansas City with Kansas City he could. Wizards. He, he could. could. I mean, obviously, anything anything can happen. I just, I, I wish we had a system where, you know, it was more oriented to, around talent about what you have done and whether you have demonstrated that you're good at something because I I don't like the idea of coaches you know losing in one team then going to another team and losing and going to another team and losing and continually getting jobs because it's sad for me as an MLS fan because it makes me think you know that we're not investing in promoting talented coaches who show that they can win and are good and that's what I would like I'd like to have a system where like really talented people rise to the top and the untalented ones who don't do good jobs are fired well well but, uh, no I mean it, it makes sense it, because that's fair I mean that makes sense and that's fair I understand why you want that I will say this in my final thing just in Curtin Alfo before we get mm -hmm. out of here and again um, well, wait I, a second. We have more to talk. I want to talk about cost cutting. We uh, we can talk about cost cutting. You want to okay, talk about? All right, more? go ahead. No, I, I'll, okay. We'll say Curtin Alfo. Let me finish this, and then we'll talk about the right. the quote unquote cost. cost cutting. All right. Yes. Um, so um, I think that if you look at it, if you want to feel optimistic about Curtin Alfo, if you're looking for a reason, he hasn't been a head coach for six years, roughly. All right, his he got fired by DC United in 2010 so in August of 2010. Stuff. So maybe, and he's been under the tutelage of Mr. Bruce Arena. Maybe he has learned some stuff. Maybe that's why. Maybe he has such a unique relationship with the players right now that this is the perfect person to take over. That everybody feels comfortable with it. Not that I'm saying, by the way, that I don't think that would have happened with Dave Sarakin. 
Um, I know, Dave. I know. Mm. It's just interesting. Again, I have. I, I'm going to reach out to Dave to see if I can get him to come on the show, and if he'll do it, oh. um, then I will give you that guy that interview. Um, I'll talk as long as he wants to talk. So uh, that that'll be. I'll put put that on my homework list, uh, possibly for next week. We'll see how it all pans out, and and if we can get it done, because uh, I'd love to talk. Dave's been on the show so many times, such a good friend of the show. I would love to at least be get a chance to say goodbye and thank you. I know. Um, God, I mean, if all the people like Dave is gone, and I know. like we don't even get a goodbye. I know. I don't even get nothing. I get nothing. All right. All right. So let's talk about this. In Grant Wall's article, Mm -hmm. um, he talks about AEG and perhaps the mandate, although I've been told it is not a mandate, perhaps the mandate to edge, and this is a direct quote because I remembered it perfectly, edge closer to profitability. AEG wants the LA Galaxy to edge closer to profitability. Ah, yes. Corporate speak is so much fun. I enjoy it. Um, so this has prompted a lot of people to say that you know the LA Galaxy are cost cutting. That uh, clearly they're 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 jettisoning uh, the chance for for three designated players. Uh, I've been attacked on Reddit. I, I I want people to know that Wendy <laughs> Wendy I try to report things as I get them, and that if I throw an opinion in, it, it's like I, I try to form that opinion around what I have learned, not what I feel, but what I have learned. Um, and so whenever people want to argue with me about things, they're like, I can't believe you said that the LA Galaxy are going to have three designated players. That doesn't seem like that's going to happen. Don't you read anything? And I'm like, yeah, I do. And, and the stuff I read is I think they'll still have three designated players. So if people are worried about the LA Galaxy, for sure two designated players, and I think very, very likely a third designated player. Are they all going to be $7 million Steven Gerrard? God, I hope not. Uh, Steven Gerrard <laughs> contracts? I don't think so because I think there's value in not doing that, and we talked about some of that with the TAM, but yeah. I do think that the LA Galaxy are saving money. I don't necessarily think that they're cutting costs. They're not jettisoning, jettisoning, I can't even, I jettisoning, um, you know, payroll. I don't think that they're doing it to because they think that they're spending too much money. I do think that the designated players that they signed and how much they're paying them, it was a little out of control in the last couple of years, quite honestly, especially for what you were getting on the field. But I think that if the LA Galaxy go out and make smart designated player signings, perhaps a young DP, I would love to see the LA Galaxy find uh, a young designated yeah, that'd player. That would be awesome. And, I would be totally down for a young DP. Yeah, and that is a way to save money because it hits less salary cap. Um, and it's a way to, to also... Out, you know, not put out as much cash because you're not going to have to pay that young DP seven million dollars. Maybe you can get them for you know two and a half million dollars or one and a half million dollars. Whatever it is, you can do that and you save money that way. But I think that the the skew towards younger is going to help them edge closer to profitability. I don't think it's this huge horrible thing. I think this is actually what LA Galaxy fans might want. I know you don't want to hear that because I'm saying that the LA Galaxy might restrict their cash in some areas, but I think they're going to try to spend it smarter and that's I I've I've listened. I've seen you guys on Twitter. I hear you call into the show. You want them to be younger. Younger is really cheaper in the overall long-term things in Major League Soccer. I think that's going to happen, and I think you're going to get what you want, and you're going to get a designated player. And I think that if the Galaxy have a chance to go after a giant signing, Wendy, like somebody who's young, uh, maybe like Eaton, there, you can't, I was going to say David Beckham caliber, but like who else is David? You can't, there's nobody else who is like that. But like somebody who's maybe 31 or 32 years old who still has a bunch of talent left on their legs, some time left on their legs, some guys, I think that they would still go out and spend that money. Um, so that's my, that's my primary, feeling. My primary issue with this, it, this cost cutting notion is that I think it miscasts. Um, what the role of sort of money in the league. And I hate it when league officials or owners or journalists talk about a team's profitability and characterize it the same way that you and I talk about like our checking accounts. Right. Because when it comes to how a billionaire conceptualizes profitability, you need to compare the annual revenue losses versus the appreciation of the asset into which you are investing the money. So okay. if you okay. lose hold, three hold, million right, hold what? on. I was gonna are you gonna give us like a, a really easy example because you used a bunch yes. of words okay. again. Okay, okay. Fine, go, yes. ahead. Yes. Go, ahead. A, a, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yes. So if Donald Sterling buys the LA Clippers for twelve point five million dollars in nineteen eighty one. Right and sells them in 2014 for $2 billion right. to Steve Ballmer, right. then hypothetically, if he lost 
ten million dollars a year on the Clippers, which I'm not saying he did. I have no idea. Right. Um, in terms of the liquid investment that he put into them, that right. he would still have realized a profit of one billion seven hundred and sixty-eight million dollars. There is no stock. There is no annuity. Right. There is no bond which provides that return on your investment. So if Forbes values the LA Galaxy at $100 million in 2008, at $170 million in 2013, at $265 million in 2016. Even if Phil Anschultz lost $5 million a year in terms of the liquid investment into the LA Galaxy, if he had bought the team in 2008 and sold it in 2016, he still would have realized a profit of $125 million. And I hate it when people uh, conceptualize profits and losses in terms of uh, without acknowledging that asset appreciation is the primary vehicle that these investors are evaluating when they're looking at their investment portfolios. That's why when the league is evaluating potential expansion teams, that it wants to see well-financed investment groups because it needs to know that the investment group has the liquid capital and other parts of its portfolio to absorb annual losses amounting to a few million dollars a year with the understanding that the investment group's part, that it's investing in an asset which is appreciating a rate which more than offsets the losses that it takes in terms of its liquid capital. And I, it frustrates me when people talk about teams losing money and right. they say, we lost $3 million or $5 million or $6 million without acknowledging that this asset is appreciating at a rate which far outstrips those losses. Yeah, no, and I agree with you 100%. You know, basically, the liquid capital is basically cash. I mean, if you want to, if you want to. So they just need, listen, you're looking for guys who, who have the money so that way they can have losses. I mean, you look at Frank McCourt and the Dodgers. I know lots of people hate Frank McCourt. Frank McCourt almost bankrupted the Dodgers. Frank McCourt ended up walking away with so much money from that deal. <laughs> it's it's kind of sad and scary and everything else. It's how the rich keep getting richer. Uh, you have to have money to, to make money, one of those things. And it, and it is. And if you look at Uncle Phil and, and Phil Anschutz. Uncle Phil's doing fine. Okay? Uncle, Uncle Phil's fine. And listen, I think the AEG as a whole is looking to, you know, they have. They're, yeah, they have they're, a lot of different properties. And some of them are more lucrative than others. And that has to do with a lot. I can tell you it has to do a lot to do with the music industry and, and the, pro, the value of streaming versus owning owning venues and how you, I mean, I, I know a little bit cause I've worked in some entertainment law. I know a bit about the music industry. AG has a huge portfolio of assets. Oh, so gigantic. Some of, which, some of which you, you know, you can't realize the profits on a sports team until you sell it. And at that time you realize you recognize in your tax returns and whatever billions of dollars in profits. But until that time you're, you may be losing money. You may be gaining money just marginally. It's, 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 but that is just one piece of their portfolio, which has, a, it's. I promise you, AEG's portfolio is diversified. Oh, oh, it's, it's diversified. I mean, they're in the entertainment industry. They own, um, like you said, there's there's music there's music properties in there. There's also like they own venues. venues yeah, the venues are the huge part of that. Where concert venues, I think O2 Arena in uh, in London is theirs. AEG. I mean, you're talking about some of the largest venues in the world. AEG is owning around the world. So, they, listen, I'm not worried about them, and I'm not worried necessarily that this LA Galaxy, quote unquote cost cutting I, j I don't I don't want you to think of it that way because I don't think that it is in the terms of they're slashing budgets they're firing people do, do I think that that and, and let me see how I can phrase this do I think that Pete Vianas and if Curtin Awful gets named head coach do I think that they're you know cheaper options than perhaps other people yes I do um, and I think that that is one of the considerations they're making. And if you're an LA Galaxy fan that makes you mad, then you can be mad all you want. That's fine. I just don't think that the LA Galaxy on the field is going to struggle from sort of, and it's not a directive. I think it's more of a, a general direction that they'd like to head in towards edging to closer towards profit profitability. Now, whether or not that's even that the LA Galaxy, that AEG wants to sell the LA Galaxy, it wasn't long ago that AEG was up for sale. Um, yeah, I remember that. And Uncle Phil pulled that back off the market, and so Uncle Phil's still there. I still think that if Chris Klein and Dan Beckerman um, decide that they have a player that they need to have, that it fits the general direction of where the club is going, a younger player, and they need to splash the cash, that they can make that request to Uncle Phil, and Uncle Phil will greenlight it. I really do. Uncle Phil's never stood in the way of any signing, realistically, the LA Galaxy have wanted to make. He's always found the cash. I think that that continues, even in a skew towards a younger 
team. I do think there's something to the fact that the LA Galaxy will reduce the total amount of money that they're throwing at the team, and I think they'd have to after you look at last season and just the gross amounts of money that was sitting on the bench any, <laughs> at any given Ugh. time between Steven Gerrard and Robbie Keane. That's horrible. And if you're looking at that from the outside view, Wendy, how do you not tell the LA Galaxy to spend wisely? And I think that's what they're coming to. It's a spend wisely direction. We're going to see how it plays out, but I think the LA Galaxy are pointed in the right direction in terms of skewing younger. I like that. Um, whether like or not, that yeah, whether or not Anolfo and Viennese work out, have no idea. Don't know, won't no know for idea. a little while. None of us, and by the way, no one can say that they do. I'm not happy about it because I don't, as I said, I don't like what it indicates about decision-making generally. But honestly, everything that's happened in the LA Galaxy for the past eight years has been at the behest of Bruce Arena, good and bad. Right. So right now, we just have no idea. We, ha we, have, z we have zero idea. We know nothing. Um, we'll see as they start to make their decisions. Wendy's will be able to evaluate those decisions and what they have done. That starts with the expansion draft coming up and whether or not Bruce Arena set up that list before, it really won't matter because the guys who are under pressure right now are LA Galaxy president Chris Klein, who I am hoping to have on the podcast after the first of the year. Uh, we did it in the offseason last year where he came into the studio if I can work something out like that again I will have him back in the studio and we'll do it live and you guys can call in and, and ask questions if, if we can do that Chris is always great and if not if I can just get him on the phone for an interview and do 15 or 20 minutes where I ask him questions I'll ask for your questions so that way we can try to get a representative answer Chris Klein is on the hook now uh, there's no yeah, more deferring so. yeah Chris, so. yeah Pete Vianis on the hook now um, you're yeah. seeing a lot of these. Yeah, he was just hired by Chris Klein. So it's like Chris Klein hired the guy who then is also going to hire the coach. Okay. I think Chris Klein is. He's, yeah, he is the guy he right now. He made some big decisions this offseason. For me, the litmus test of whether we're headed in the right direction is going to be I'm going to be looking at the roster uh, before the season starts in 2017 saying, have we gotten younger? Are we spending money wisely? And who have we signed? Because yep. we, the LA Galaxy has two open DP slots, and I do want to see something, some big name, something impressive, someone who's under the age of 30 who I think will be a huge contributor. I want to see that. I'm my 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 ceiling on age for a designated player will be like 31 32. Yeah, like 31 32. I, no one who's 35. Yeah, I, I, and I don't I don't think they're going to go that way. I think the LA yeah. Galaxy will still sign. The, here's here's the timing, right? And this is where people are going to judge or not judge. I think the LA Galaxy will definitely sign one designated player before the season starts. Whether or not they sign two will depend entirely on who is available and when they can get them. All right. It, unfortunately, because MLS schedule does not line up with the rest of the world, you will get guys in the summer window. We know about that. So yeah, whether yeah. whether or not you want to throw all your poker chips out there, which, by the way, in my opinion, it's better to get a guy at the beginning of the MLS season. So somebody who's coming off midseason from Europe or, or around the world and get a guy who's a little bit less good than possibly somebody you could get in the middle of the season because everybody takes time to adjust to Major League Soccer. So that's, I'm okay with that. Go find two designated players, have them ready. The moment camp opens, have everybody in place, get this team starting to gel because like I said, I expect a large portion of this LA Galaxy team to return. I expect all of your starters realistically to be back. Um, Jossie Zardes, Giovanni oh God, Dos Santos. Even like Jeff Lorenkowitz. And... I, I, th I think that you'll see, he could be another filler. Um, oh. Uh, and I liked. I thought Jeff did an okay job. Right. Listen, right. he, could, he was trying to follow up Nigel De Jong, who would have been the team MVP if he would have been oh. around. Okay, so that whole thing. And by the way, I'm telling you right now, we have no idea what happened with Nigel De Jong. I hear more and more stories continuously. I've heard, I've heard at least a dozen different stories. So and, I don't, and I can't tell you what's true and what's not true. Otherwise, I'd tell you if I knew. Um, but there's so many stories out there. We have no. I'm just telling you, we have no idea what happened with Nigel De Jong and why he left the LA Galaxy. That is going to be a question mark that may only get answered when Bruce Arena writes his tell-all book, and it doesn't get released until after the uh, the great one, uh, Bruce Arena, uh, the king of U.S. soccer, uh, <laughs> decides to maybe kick it. He might just have to hold that book until he dies. That might be the way Bruce Arena rocks out of this world. All right. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, expansion draft coming up. MLS Cup obviously coming up on Saturday. Go Toronto. Yes, Toronto, Seattle. Yeah. It's going to be a big game. Let's 
let's watch it. Let's let's watch it and uh, go Toronto. Go go Toronto. Go Toronto. Don't make 2016 any worse than it already has been in my I soccer really life. I think I would love actually to see Jovinko win the MLS Cup. I really would. I really I really like that. I mean, I I I'm really excited about what he's done for the league and the team, and I'm going to be rooting wholeheartedly for Toronto on Saturday. I I can't wait. I'm 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 I'm, I'm ecstatic. I hate I hate MLS Cups that don't involve the LA Galaxy because yeah, because no. that means I'm not there either. If the LA Galaxy are there, then I like I would pony up. I would be in Toronto right now if the LA Galaxy were there. That's how. That's what would be happening. And you guys would have got like this super long 15 minute intro that goes over the highs and lows of the entire season, set to NFL Films background music. And that's two years in a row that you have been deprived of that awesomeness. And I apologize because I can't do them without an MLS Cup. There's just no motivation for me to do them unless there's an MLS Cup. Somebody said I should do one for every game, and I slapped that person. So don't worry about that. <laughs> All right, uh, we are once again on an irregular schedule. I don't know when we'll be back. We'll be back whenever there's news. Um, that could be as soon as next week. In fact, I would I would say that you know there's I, again I don't see any reason why the LA Galaxy need to wait any longer in in doing any of this Cardinal Alpha stuff. It seems so obvious that he's the choice um, that they should just go ahead and announce it so that way we can all um, get move on with our lives. All right, that's that's what I'm asking. LA Galaxy, please just announce it so that way I can like just write the article <laughs> and then we can like start talking about other things because it's exhausting. All right, Wendy, tell people where they can find you. We'll get on out of here. Well, it's the off season, so I'm not around except really on Twitter. But ordinarily, you can find me at Corner of the Galaxy and American Soccer Now, and of course at Twitter on Bard's Blog. All right, and if you're looking for me on Twitter, it's at Jay Gessman, J G U E S M A N, and of course at Galaxy Podcast is where you can find all of our information on Twitter. Go to cornerofthegalaxy.com where you can find all of our articles, all of our wonderful writing about the LA Galaxy, um, and of course we have all of the, the latest stuff. Some some things I'm working on should be coming out in the next couple weeks and some off-season articles and fun things there so go over to cornerofthegalaxy.com and check out all of that stuff all right that does it just a little hour and 15 minute show for you it's because we haven't been around in a while that's what happens all right for miss wendy thomas i'm josh guessman you've been listening to corner of the galaxy on cornerofthegalaxy.com we'll catch you next time you've been listening to the corner of the galaxy podcast on cornerofthegalaxy.com you can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Galaxy Podcast. And be sure to check out and subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching for Corner of the Galaxy. And for all of your independent LA Galaxy news, discussion, and entertainment, including this podcast, head on over to cornerofthegalaxy.com. Fans, thanks for listening. We ask that you be kind and courteous to your neighbors as you leave the podcast. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. Until then, I'm Michael Araujo, and on behalf of the entire Corner of the Galaxy crew, goodbye, everybody.